Hey guys, welcome back to the And She Laughs podcast. Uh, my name is Trisha. My name is Julie, and I forgot my cue there. I was supposed to hop in and say <laughs> And She Laughs podcast with Trisha, that's but that's okay. That's about you rock how that. life is. Thank you, you. You rock that. <laughs> Can't do it without you. Um, so. Y'all just need to know how amazing our morning has gone. <laughs> um, we live in the sticks, AKA so not amazing. <laughs> we live in the sticks, so internet was um, so sketchy today. But we're here, and the internet did not join us for this morning right. <laughs> Um, right. But here we are. We have persevered. We are persevering. <laughs> and it's happen. early. It's early, y'all. But we but we are. We're excited. Yeah. We're still excited because we, we have something to feel like the Lord is going to share. Yes. Um, and I also want to say, like, when when we're sharing things that the Lord has shared with us, we're re-experiencing it. And um, God's doing something new in us. So we're just really yeah. excited about today. And we want to say thanks for tuning in. Let's yes. go. Let's do it. So we are um, jumping back into um, God is a God of process. Um, that's where we feel like he's uh, led us. And we're just, it's going to be a little stories. bit of a theme for yeah. um, a couple of our, our episodes here because um, this God is a God of pilgrimage. God is a God of process. Yeah. Um, obviously we're all, he's still working on me. Oh, show. Um, so we're <laughs> still experiencing this God of process and God of pilgrimage. Um, but we want to kind of highlight different aspects of our stories where this has become um, just so clear through uh, certain parts of the pilgrimage, um, certain stops on the journey. Yeah. And I actually, um, this God of process, God of pilgrimage started in me. I kind of dove into it because it was something that you, Julie, um, were walking through. It was a revelation that God gave you during a really significant uh, season mm -hmm. of your life and mm -hmm. of your family's life. Yeah. And so uh, what we're going to do uh, over the next couple of weeks, we will kind of focus on um, like a majority of Julie of a part of Julie's story or a majority part of my story where this has been very evident and revelations that have come from those. Um, this week um, I've asked Julie to really dive into um, this significant season and um, lessons um, from our God of process that she went through. So um, yeah, share with us. well, um, first I'd like to say that um, David says to us in Psalms 107 too, that if God has redeemed you, that you should shout about it, you know, that you should tell people about it. Um, so I also think it's really cool for you guys to hear uh, Trisha's story and my story. And we were raised in the same home. We were raised by the same amazing mom and dad and how different our stories are. Um, and perspectives from, yes, our perspectives, some same things. And we walk through some different things. Um, but the process of, <laughs> of perspective is, is different. And so yeah. yeah, the revelation is different. Yeah, for sure. So we um, were raised in a really amazing Christian home. Um, our dad was uh, a Baptist music choir leader. Um, he was an ordained deacon. And um, my mom was our children's church leader. Um, our dad was a bald hyper guy. Um, amazing. Our, <laughs> amazing. <laughs> So hyper. Yes. Um, and our mom, of course, um, just amazing. balanced all like, of that, <laughs> like her steadiness and her consistency, but she was our, our children's church leader. And, um, you know, they were super faithful in, um, as far as painting the picture, church. this was a pretty small church, tiny, tiny, tiny little Baptist. Southern Baptist church, <laughs> um, where we were raised and, um, you know, they were really devout in what they did. Mom was uh, always extremely intentional about um, writing songs to teach us scripture and writing songs to teach us about heroes in the faith and pillars in the faith. And um, 
sometimes I, I literally, if I'm trying to name all the disciples, I'll sing the song, you know, like, you know, name all. 12 disciples. Yes. And I, I can name all the 12 <laughs> disciples or I can sing all the books of the Bible. Or I remember scripture because of songs that my mom wrote yeah. or, or a story of Daniel because of my song. And if I'm preaching, I can make that sound like, so always like TD Jakes, like being confident of this, but on the inside, I'm like being confident of this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and our mom and our dad were extremely uh, diligent about taking us to church. So um, steady, very, very yeah. steady. I want to sidebar here because now I'm a parent, three children. I have a teenager, a 13 year old, a 10 year old and a five year old. And I, I came to this place in my life where I was like, I don't want my children to have, you know, the same um, brokenness that I had. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, um, their story is their story. So even if you are a as perfect as a parent as you can be, there's still going to be brokenness in their story. They're still going to need me. And so mm -hmm. our mom and dad were great, but my journey was my journey. My decisions, my wandering away from Christ happened because of choices that I made. Our, were our parents perfect? No. And you can raise a children, children in a home without trauma, but there's still dysfunction because we're broken. Right. Um, we need Jesus. We are imperfect. Yeah, we so are imperfect. You cannot so create you can't, a perfect home. Exactly. And you can't raise perfect out of imperfect. Anyway, um, when I became a teenager, uh, there was a lot of influences in the world and wandering away. And um, I think one of my biggest things was I just, I was a serial dater. I loved to feel value in a relationship and I didn't date bad boys, but they were teenage boys, you know? Sure. So um, there was a, a major straying away from the Lord. But maybe weren't raised in strong Christian homes. No, they weren't. Yeah. yeah. And so there was an influence there, um, an imbalance of, of, you know, spirituality there. And so wandering away from the Lord, but I always remember these like amazing, our parents, again, were really diligent about taking us to church. And then we did retreats during the summer. And I remember my junior year, um, coming back from a, tr a retreat in the summer and really, really, really trying so hard to keep my relationship with the Lord, um, mm -hmm. strong and faithful. And, um, one of my friends asked me to speak at Christian club. And I remember, um, going to Christian club and speaking at Christian club. And there was a guy in the room. I don't know his name. I don't know where he is. I don't know who he was, but he was a youth pastor that came to sit in on, um, uh, the Christian club. And it was the first person who ever prophesied over me after I got done, um, preaching at Christian club, he came up to me and he said, Hey, have you ever thought about ministry? And I bless his bones. <laughs> I laughed, I laughed in his, in his sweet little face. He was a tiny little guy with glasses. <laughs> and I was like, bah, ha, ha, ha. I just, I laughed straight in his face. And he goes, I think you're called to preach. You're called to preach the gospel. Dang, man. And I, um, I actually, that was brought back to my memory a couple of weeks ago. And I, I, I literally just cried. I don't know who this guy is. I don't know where he is, but he spoke that over my life. And now I'm living in the echoes of it. Um, I strayed away from the Lord um, again and again and again. When I came home from my freshman year of college, um, I was pregnant and I was flunking out of school and, um, and I was working multiple jobs. Um, I decided to have an abortion and I was trying to heal from all the things that nobody tells you that you're going to heal from as far as an abortion is concerned, because the mind, the, the flesh is relieved, but the soul grieves. And I was grieving deeply. She was also grieving. You were grieving on your own because, um, because we had grown up in a strong Christian family. And so there was not, um, I think in today's world, there's a lot more room for grace, not that our parents would have been lacking grace, but there's a fear of lack of grace. And so, um, I actually remember mom busting into our bathroom because there had been an abortion search on our computer and she right. was like, Hey girls looked at the internet history. And, and I was like, it was me. Um, Trisha totally had, took the fall. I had me. never been on a date 
Um, right. like, and so I was like, it was me. And mom went, really? And I was like, yeah, in Mr. Blackman's history class, we were talking about Roe versus Wade. And I just went on this long, um, and I was like, mom, did you think I had an abortion? Oh my gosh. Ha ha and um you can see the relief on mom's face right. um and she walked out and i looked at julie and i was like spill and i and you didn't you did no. not spill yeah um, i was grieving all on my own you were doing it alone and i also so. carried the weight of like i thought mom and dad would blame themselves um for my spiral i thought mom and dad would carry the weight of like where did we go wrong did we not like so i i that was definitely something there were many layers to um to that, you know, yeah. that season that was really hard. But so much of it was was in in darkness. It was. It was, it was in secret. It and, was. Um, because it was so much, and you didn't you didn't know what to do with Correct. it, and you didn't have anybody there for you. Yeah, and I think God, like God, where the what the enemy meant for your destruction, God means for your good, and so God used that the abortion and, and the depression and the grieving that I was going through to draw me to him and the loneliness and the loneliness he sets the lonely in families, you know, like he used every aspect, every single piece that the enemy meant for, for evil mm -hmm. God in his process and in, in your pilgrimage. Yeah. Like it blows my mind. So, um, I was, Again, healing. So there's this, there's a physical healing, there's an emotional healing, and there's an, a, sp a spiritual healing. And all I was doing was the physical healing part. The emotional and the spiritual, you know, I, I was just reeling in that. Um, and those are the parts that no physician can address. Only the heavenly physician can yeah. address those things. So it was close to Trisha's birthday. Um, <laughs> she had, she had a birthday and I asked her what she wanted for her birthday. I had, I had talked to her about the abortion and she was like the only person that was in it with me. And when I asked her what she wanted for her birthday, she said, I want you to go to church with me. So there was a church that was, that was a revival yeah, service. really huge revival service that was happening. And Trisha that was actually at a Pentecostal church, Correct. which was really different for us Baptist girls. Very different. <laughs> uh, but there was an expectation in my spirit, um, you know, uh, we could sit on the back row and still experience, you know, something special. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I Correct. said, well, you, could, uh, you don't have to buy me anything. You have to come to this service with me. Right. <laughs> and so Trisha's best friend, Ben, um, a guy who had grown up with us, who became my husband later, um, <laughs> was uh, speaking. He invited us to come. And that night, um, July 30th of 2003, I got <laughs> radically, radically saved that night. I remember um, a moment where the Lord uh, called me to the altar. And again, I, I was a, a bad Baptist girl. So I had never experienced, um, you know, the weightiness of the Holy Spirit. So I remember walking to the altar that night, but not making it on my feet. I remember falling to my knees and crawling um, to the first step of the altar. And I laid my face in that red shag carpet and cried out to God and um, asked him to rescue me. And, uh, that was the, and I, like, and I know this is going to be like really personal, but I want everybody to understand like the depth of this moment. Like, um, she was, she was still, she was, it's not just that she was still recovering physically from this abortion. She was, you were actively bleeding. Like, right. It was, it was the, she bled for weeks. Yes. And, um, from, from this abortion. And so like, as her body is, is still Trauma, way, like, it's trauma, and, and, yeah. I'm so broken. Yeah. God's God starts the restoration of her spirit. Correct. And and then walks her through a restoration of yeah. her body. And I remember the peace and the um just I don't know, the warmth, the warm embrace of, of the Holy Spirit that night, like I had never experienced before. The weeks to follow, um, I got uh, re-baptized and then I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And um, uh, and it was 
uh, incredible. The same night I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, I heard uh, for the first time the audible voice of God telling me that he wanted me to surrender my life to full-time ministry. And um, I thought I had an idea of what that looked like. Um, <laughs> but the God of process was gonna, yeah, the God of process all sorts of things. <laughs> is who he is. And so anyway, um, Ben and I, uh, began, um, a courtship. We, we were, we didn't date. We did courtship in the beginning of our relationship. And then, uh, he went off to ministry school. I followed him a year later and, um, and, you know, we were in, in active ministry, Again, I want to highlight again that verse that I said um, in the beginning where David said, if you have been redeemed, and I want to talk about the redemption story of my abortion really quick, because um, I think that a lot of women who are healing uh, through abortion think that um, the avoidance of the topic or the avoidance of the scenario is what is going to heal you, but that's not how God works. And, and I think that you, you contribute that or align that with an overall grieving process, a burying of something yes. and you spiritually bury. And that's not just abortion. That's, that's a lot of uh, awful things that we go through. Right. There are different kinds of trauma that right. we, and there's a mentality there that like burying it is moving on to the next thing. Right. And that often means that God has to dig it up and in some ways resurrect to create healing. Correct. Because he doesn't want you to bury it. He wants you to give it to him. Mm -hmm. Like he wants you to offer it to him open handedly. And so I had been through, uh, I prob there were probably about 12 times in my life where I had fasted concerning my abortion and healing from my abortion. Um, because that scripture where it says, it's not, is this not the fast that I have um, chosen for you? And then it says, and then your healing will break forth like the noonday. And so I, I, put that deep into my heart, like fasting brings forth healing. So I would fast and I would pray, um, about healing for my abortion. We had been in ministry for some time. We had had Isla, our first child, and there was so much healing in that for me. Um, and just the acknowledgement of there's a child that I have in heaven. And, um, and then Georgia came along and, um, and, and in raising them, I thought, I thought we were done having kids. Um, I thought we were really done. I shared my abortion story with my children very early because what you keep in secret, your children will repeat in public. And so I shared my abortion story with them very early. And, um, and then we found out we were surprise pregnant for Lily, our third child. And, um, I was so excited. Trisha was so excited. I, I, I cried a lot. She I cried called me and a she lot. was sobbing and I was so excited. Um, <laughs> well, I just, I also need to highlight the fact that we were living in a camper at the time. We well, had sold our home. We were building, uh, yeah, another home. Proximity will get you pregnant. Jessica. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so we, we found out we were surprised pregnant for Lily, um, but I knew something wasn't right in my body. Something did not feel right. And then we found out that we had actually been pregnant for twins. And one of the twins had not implanted in my uterus correctly. And it had caused a massive um, hemorrhage in my uterus and was threatening to uh, wash out the other pregnancy. So um, at 15 weeks, my water broke <coughs> with Lily. Um we went to a uh, high risk um, maternal fetal medicine uh, doctor and they confirmed that I had uh, had a premature preterm rupture of membranes and there was no residual fluid in my womb. And if you know, if you have a medical background, you know that amniotic fluid is the literal breath in a child's lungs they inside. They actually called her a fish out of water. They did. They called her a fish out of water. And at the time we didn't know it was a her. They told us right. we don't see a nasal bone or a stomach or anything. So the child has down syndrome. Um, we know that the child, we don't think there's a stomach present. Um, we think the best thing is for you to terminate this pregnancy. And I remember laying on that table and looking over at the screen and seeing a heartbeat and going, what, well, that baby has a heart. That baby's heart 
is beating. And I was immediately reminded of the 19 year old girl who out of convenience and fear had um, walked through a crowd of protesters into an abortion clinic. And I even remember a woman who threw a Coke can at me. And I remember the Coke, uh, drops of Coke had splashed across my hand. So sitting in the waiting room, I kept thinking I need to wash my hands because my hands were sticky. I remembered that girl and I wanted to hug her and hold her. Um, but again, I was in a place where convenience and fear told me that I, I should act, I should act on, on fear. And I rested in the promises of the Lord that he had created this life, that he had made this life and that I was not the author and the finisher of my future, that God is the author and the finisher of my future. And God is the author and the finisher of my children's future. And so, uh, Ben looked at me in that moment and I, I remember looking at the doctor and said, well, that's just not an option for us. Terminating the pregnancy is not my job and it's not your job. That's God's job. And if God doesn't want this pregnancy to go to full term, then he will be the one, um, he will be the one who authors and finishes that story. And she, and you said, you were like, yeah. whatever it looks like, whatever if it looks no like stomach, if, if Correct. there's something like whatever she, it looks if, like, if I'm this baby has out. down syndrome, whatever that looks like, that's, that's what I'm walking out. And, um, I was still really emotionally reeling, um, and, and having a really hard time emotionally with how I felt about the pregnancy. And I remember I went into, uh, our, our little sitting area. And that night and Ben came out and he was like, are you okay? I was like, I just need you to go and put the kids to bed. And I'm going to, I'm going to have a conversation with the Lord. I'm, I'm putting out a fleece. We got some stuff to talk. We got to, oh, I got to hash this out with the Lord. And so if you don't mind, I'm going to sit here in this chair and I'm not going to get up until the Lord speaks to me. And so he put the kids to bed and I sat in that chair and I remember I went to open my mouth to talk to the Lord. And he said, yes. Yes, what is it? What's your request? And I said, well, I, my request is that if you're not going to see this pregnancy through, that I'll go ahead and miscarry. I want to miscarry. I want to miscarry by the morning. If you are not going to see this pregnancy through. And I remember him saying, Yes, I will see this pregnancy through. You will hold a healthy baby. Mm. There's not enough time on this episode for me to even detail for you how many miracles we needed in that season. It wasn't just holding a healthy baby. I, I couldn't work. I had no job. We needed financial support. Our children were in private Christian school. We had tuition to pay. They told me, you know, at 22 weeks, I'd have to move into the hospital and I have to live away from my family inside of the hospital. Um, at the time, I had a three-year-old and I had a seven-year-old and and uh, a husband in full-time ministry. We were campus pastors at the time. You know, he worked 50 hours a week. And, uh, and that was another living, miracle. You were living in a camper because... We um, were building a were house. Building a house. So um, if you if you know Julie, you know like she. I loves am the to Martha Stewart of our home. home. <laughs> there was just so many right. things happening, right? And God set you in this hospital bed. He did. It was once we once we made it to twenty two weeks, which was crazy. Miracle. Every time I would tell a medical professional, "This is what we're going through," they're like, "What?" <laughs> um, then we make it to the hospital, and then. Every week, almost, I had a, 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 another, you know, doctor or um, nurse practitioner that came in the room and says, well, these are the problems that you're going to encounter. Um, you know, we had found out it was a baby girl and um, we had decided, you know, we were going to name her Lillian after my great grandmother and my grandmother and um, who are faith filled women. Um, and and I would greet these medical professionals um, as they would come in and they would say, well, she's never going to walk. She, she won't cry when she comes out. She's going to have, um, you, she's going to need a lot of therapy. Um, you know, there were so many things that they had to say that, 
that look that were factual on paper. You know, they were there's no way this child is going to be fully developed. That process, when they would come in and say those things to me, I remember standing in the mirror because they, they said when she's born, she won't cry. Her lungs won't be strong enough to cry. Um, you know, you won't get to see her. You, you won't get, get to, to see her. her. We'll have to take her, her away immediately. Yeah. immediately. All these things. And I remember standing in the mirror and combating everything that they would say. I would say, you will cry. You are going to scream your little head off. You are going to be so strong. You're going to scream your little head off. You will walk. You will run. You are going to play. You are going to be fast and wild as the wind. Literally, her body got to the point where going to the bathroom made you dizzy. Correct. Like your entire being was focused on preserving and fighting for this life. Right. And so. So opposite of the 19-year-old girl that I <laughs> once was. And, and I think that that's what people, what, what. God has to reveal to us about redemption is that we think redemption is, is like just the other side of something. Correct. But redemption is actually God allowing the new you to face that thing that yes. has owned you, that thing that was in the darkness, that thing. And the new you gets to conquer. Yes. And the new you gets to choose life. Yes. And the new you gets to stare fear in the face right. and tell it who our God right. is. And right. redemption is, is p ultimately why God's leading us through the process. Correct. Uh, part, the pilgrimage is so that when we get to this full circle moment that it's like, my God, only God can get the Correct. glory for this Correct. moment. And the reason God only gets the glory is because in the beginning, that situation, my 19 year old me, that abortion, that time in my life was absent of God. And then this portion of my life with Lily was full of God. And the difference that it makes is just night and day. And he says, I want you to see this situation absent of me. And I want you to see the situation full of me. And so every single decision that we made was based on what the Holy Spirit was telling us to do and the relationship that we had with the Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us um, through that season. So we made really good friends with doctors and nurses, all these doctors together in this room, people from the NICU team. I had like four <laughs> doctors in the room, Ben, Trisha, mom. And then of course my precious labor and delivery nurses that were in there too. So there was, a, we had a slew. We call that a slew here in the South. That was a slew of people in the room. And I have it, I have it on camera. I literally like was pushed against the wall and I was holding my arm <laughs> high in the air as it would go so that I could like lean over and record because that baby it, she didn't come out blue. No. And she didn't come she out was, quiet. No. She came out screaming. She was. In the video, you hear Lily, like, crying, and then you hear me. <laughs> I'm just crying. I'm rejoicing in the Lord because he is so faithful. He is who he says he is. And when she came out screaming, I knew that that the power of life and death had been in my tongue. It had been in the community's tongue that had proclaimed life over her, proclaimed life over her, and that our God is not a man that he would lie. He is a faithful, faithful God. They assessed her. They brought her over to me. And, yeah, and I that remember. that was the other thing. They, they put her like on the car and they were, they were going to weigh her. And um, they were all kind of looking at each other as if they didn't know what to do because it wasn't the 911 that they had planned for. Correct. So they're kind of looking, they're doing their jobs. They're working on her. They're, you know, right. But they're kind of looking at each other and the doctor's like, uh, right. mom, you want to see her? Yes. And so, yeah, they put her on a CPAP <laughs> machine. Her O2 levels were a little low. They put her on a CPAP machine, but the, I remember the nurse practitioner that had visited me numerous times in my room, brought her over to me and said, Miss Ragsdale, I want you to know that this is best case scenario. I, I just, I don't know what else to say. She's needing a little oxygen. She's on a CPAP. We think she has um, club feet. Actually, it was just her legs had been turned a certain way with no water. It was a, a dry bird and it took a little occupational therapy, but those were the two things that they but said to me. one of those things actually worked out because the, they, they put tape on her foot. Correct. Like that was that the, they, this, this child that they said was never going to walk, that. tape fixed it. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I would just like to say... Um, that she's fast. 
She is. She does. She run. is the fastest little runner you've ever seen, uh, especially when she's trying to outrun her mama, trying to Ooh, catch child. her and discipline her. And she, uh, has, she is uh, so fast. Curly, wild hair. <laughs> she, um, she and I went to see the pulmonologist yesterday, and um, we have an amazing pulmonologist. But on the way, uh, she said, she said, um, "Mommy, are you going to pray for me before we go into the pulmonologist?" I said, "I, I sure am. We do every time." And um, anyway, she said, before we got out of the car, she was like, well, can I pray today? And I said, yes. And um, anyway, she said, Lord, we thank you for Dr. Khan, but we don't want to come here anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, one day, kiddo, one day, kiddo, we won't, we won't have to see your pulmonologist anymore. But that's where we are. We are, again, just in awe of God. We are in awe of, of all that he does. Um, but it, it's a really beautiful redemption story. Yeah. But it's also, um, again, how God does things. He never does things for a singular purpose. He does things in yes. layers. And so even that you were struggling in quiet and in secret and in loneliness, you now shout from the rooftops yes. what God did in my life. And you're able to face down fear every time you tell your story yes. because you're not a scared little girl. No. You're the daughter of the most high God. Yes. And I just, I don't, I don't know what processes you guys are going through. And I know that today has been a little bit longer. Um, but we're sharing this because we're not just proclaiming the goodness of God and the redemption of God. We are telling you that we have seen it with our own eyes. We've and lived we it. have lived it yeah. with our lives and that God is not, <laughs> he is not a favor of his children. You, his daughters, you, his sons, if we have any sons that are tuning in, <laughs> um, <laughs> He fa he favors you. He yeah. loves you. He fights for you. He has redemption for you. Whatever it is that you're walking through that you're not sure what to do with it, lay it at his feet. Correct. Start right there yeah. and watch him work miraculous wonders in your life. Yeah. And I also want to say that if any of you are like afraid of the redemptive process, I will tell you that it has brought the most joy, the most healing, the most... Um, I, I work work. Yes. There's work to it. There's always work. There's it's always so worth it because he partners with us, you know, but I, I will tell you that I think it's been the greatest process in my life to watch God walk with me through my healing journey. Um, I, I will tell you that I still think about that child that's in heaven. I remember when our dad passed, the first thing I thought of was he's getting to meet his grandchild. And I, I want you to know that the pain of that um, is so different now. The pain of that is not in secret. It's not, um, do, I, do I regret? Yes, a 100%, absolutely. But the shame of it is now, um, the shame of it is now my story. The shame that it's, it's what God redeemed, you yeah. know, God has redeemed that. And now I get to share with other women who have been through um, that trauma and who have been through that, that horrible grieving season, what God can do. Yeah. Um, I do want to throw out a recommendation. Um, as soon as the song mercy of God by belonging company was released, I sent it to Julie because the whole song is just about, um, that, that moment that God redeemed you. And, um, I remember Julie running up to that altar and laying on that red shag carpet. And one of the things that I admire and love and respect about my, my biological sister, my sister in Christ is that she found herself at that altar and then you never looked back. Mm -mm. the mercy of God came in and you chose that day after day. And I would definitely recommend a listen to that song about just being reminded of when the mercy of God took over your life, yes. <laughs> took over your story, yes. became Lord of your life. Um, I just, I would love to throw out that recommendation for, um, for a fun listening pleasure. I don't know why I said pleasure. I cry every time I listen to it, but it's a good cry. It's a yeah, really good cry. Sure. Um, we love you guys. Yes. And uh, next week we will continue on God of Process with a little bit of my story. Yeah, you get to hear from Trisha next and, week. And um, sorry if we made you cry. Not sorry. Sorry, um, not sorry. We cry. 
<laughs> but um, thank you for tuning in to And She Laughs podcast, and we'll see you next week. Bye, you guys. Bye.